that we said in going and attending the meeting. Now, those of you who know me know that a little bit of background, that I've been a lawyer for 35 plus years, that my clients include, I was chief counsel for the Congressional Black Caucus, and when issues came up, we would work all night to address them. So my pattern became that every, every week, at least one night, I stayed in the office overnight in order to get the work done for then what was 23 members of the Congressional Black Caucus. And the issues that we dealt with concerned immigration, concerned employment, uh, concerned criminal justice, uh, concerned minority business enterprise, concerned education, uh, concerned tax reform, issues that go to the heart of the quality of life that we live. And you know what? From those 25 years ago to today, many of the issues are the same. The question for me then becomes, have our tactics for addressing the issues changed? And I, I carry with me to many uh, public discussions like today a quote uh, by U.S. Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall a quote that he, he gave in, on July 4th, 1992. It was his last public statement prior to his retirement. And he gave it when he received the Medal of Liberty in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'll just read the quote. The legal system can force open doors and sometimes even knock down walls, but it cannot build bridges. That job belongs to you and me. The country can't do it. Afro and white, rich and poor, educated and illiterate, our fates are bound together. We can run from each other, but we cannot escape each other. We will only attain freedom if we learn to appreciate what is different and muster the courage to discover what is fundamentally the same. America's diversity offers so much richness and opportunity. Take a chance, won't you? Knock down the fences which divide. Tear apart the walls that imprison you. Reach out. Freedom lies just on the other side. We shall have freedom and liberty for all. So that I said, well, that put the lawyers in their place. <laughs> <laughs> and also, of course, there's a mandate for everyone. And, and just in researching and reading, I came across a quote that John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy, provided in 1959. He observed, when written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters, <laughs> one representing danger, the other representing opportunity. So as I thought about it, I thought about <coughs> danger and opportunity 
two sides of the same coin. <laughs> and what, what came to mind was the experience, my experiences with Holy Comforter Episcopal Church. And so I'd just like to, for those of my fellow parishioners, members of, of Holy Comforter will recognize some of this as I speak. And for others, it's, it's an observation about how of the little church that could, <laughs> hey? much like the l engine that could, the little church that could. So I pulled out, Father Davis, after I got your telephone call, <laughs> a document from the year 2000, Holy Comforter. And I'll just kind of go over it. <laughs> when we had a congregational meeting and a review of where we, our status as a church and our future as a church. It was important and it is written the following. It is important to note that in this church the devotion of African Americans and their brothers and sisters from the Caribbean and Africa to this church and to each other is not recent. Two, the official church documents and the oral history testify to the character, patience, and persistence of the Afro-Anglicans that held this church together, not just the building, but the church family, the mission, and the ministry. Three, it was characterized by a very small number of active members with a high ratio of giving. <laughs> Four, this church, by most standards, is very small. However, the sincere dedication and commitment of our small congregation to Christ, our community, and concern for the world we live in has kept us together. So, next, Based on that commitment and devotion, we built programs. And in order to achieve our vision of those programs, Father Davis commissioned a group of parishioners to conduct a long range policy and planning exercises to review the past and to look forward to then 1997, projecting and describing hopes and dreams. <laughs> well, I said, well, you know, it was a vision. It was a devotion and a commitment to marshalling the resources which were ne necessary to achieve the vision for the little church that could. <laughs> and so, as I thought further about, you know, what do we want, what would I like my contribution to be to this? I mean, I could talk about the law, I could talk about DACA, I could talk about sanctuary churches, all of which I'll be talking a lot more about around this area and across the country, particularly sanctuary churches and what we envision when we say sanctuary churches. What do 
we want to accomplish with sanctuary churches? And then how will we answer the question when we are within our churches, the question of why am I here? <laughs> and so I look for some guidance and uh, lawyers often look for guidance from judges. <laughs> and so when I can't figure out what to say, I will say I throw myself on the mercy of the court to, and ask your guidance, Your Honor, with regard to what my client <laughs> should be doing. <laughs> and so in many ways, I throw myself on the mercy of the audience <laughs> and ask the question, what should I be doing in conjunction with the concerns which have been expressed and the need for a strategy which is not only short term but is more long term because as you heard the the good speaker here indicate Many of these concerns existed with when Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House of Representatives. What we had was a slightly relaxed moment <laughs> when Barack Obama became president for eight years. The underpinning of the re oppression that we feel today has always been there. Did we fall asleep <laughs> at the wheel? Did we take for granted our preparedness for addressing the issues or was it a time to take a vacation? So I come to that asking myself that type of question because when I talk to groups uh, normally, I'm talking about their financial position and what are the programs you have and what are the laws you need to comply with in order to strengthen your financial position. So, as I, I read and did a little bit of research last night, I went to a book that I've, I've used and quoted for and in this instance, it's, it's, the Bible is presumed to be the basis for our faith and our determination, faith and works. This book is called Grassroots Leaders for a New Economy. It was written a few years ago. And as we look at what grassroots leaders do, here are a few of the things, and in the interest of time, I won't read all that I have on this piece of paper, and in the interest of that you have, um, I'm certain, a very encouraging and positive wisdom that's going to be shared with you by the, the remaining two speakers. I just kind of ask, go through this list. They raise the stakes. Civic entrepreneurs raise the stakes for their community, raising the ambitions, the expectations, the vision of their community beyond what they currently exist. Often, it's a footnote to what I'm saying. <laughs> Often, the biggest challenge in helping a community is in helping a community to break out of a cycle of pessimism. Third, don't just come to the opinion that your community can't com compete. Look at your strengths. You can make change happen if you put people together. The individual problems are the easiest. It's hardest to strike out the defeatist 
attitudes. <laughs> and so we put our energies, therefore, into building a unique, unique qualities for our region. And so then we get advice from civic entrepreneurs acting as motivators so that we are all motivated and we have things to look to. Do not use your experience with the global economy and other communities. Do, I'm sorry, use your experience with global economy and other communities to dramatize the need to change locally. You've heard, think nationally, think globally, but act locally. There's another, another that principle that you heard from the pre-opening speaker, which is capsulized in the political world as all politics is local. <laughs> all politics is local. Do search for the right motivation with meaning for your community, be that crisis or opportunity. Do confront community stereotypes by reaching out to a group, taking a stand, or otherwise showing your desire for change. Do you put skin on the table? A tangible and visible demonstration of your personal commitment to community change? Do put pressure on others to raise their sights and challenge prevailing assumptions about what is possible for the community. Don't play the blame, blame game <laughs> about the past. <laughs> Instead, offer to take shared responsibility for the future with others. Don't ask government to lead but make sure civic entrepreneurs from government and nonprofit sectors become part of the team. Don't let others look for scapegoats or wait for saviors to initiate the process of community change. Don't hesitate to start as the sole motivator, but quickly get out and get others to share and spread the motivational message. Don't raise expectations unless you're at least willing to find the right people to take over the next stage of the process. Create a sense of mission. The final motivating technique to employ is the development of a sense of mission, a fervor for change that many can share. I have some more, but I'll stop there. And I want to share them with you because in my experience as a lawyer representing large organizations, the difference between the ones which are successful and the ones that are struggling is motivation, the motivation to get out and make a difference and to go to others to get them involved to achieve the mission. So whether we're talking about the concerns of the Caribbean community in the United States, in Washington, D.C., or in Maryland, or in Virginia, or in Michigan, where I'm from, or California, all turns on our motivation and whether or not we are ready to assume the responsibility or are we just playing at being motivated. So I end with the question of why are we here? Thank you. Thank you.